Hi, I'm Nisande. Marine reptiles are a relatively rare group of animals on Earth nowadays, but what if they made a comeback? We've got marine reptiles on Earth like crocodilians, certain kinds of iguanas, snakes, and turtles, along with marine birds like penguins, albatrosses, cormorants, gulls, ox, flamingos, and many many others. And yeah, I'm counting birds in this because birds are awesome and they're reptiles too. Not in the way people say everyone's a fish because that's not true and fish aren't real. Birds are dinosaurs which are reptiles. God, I love birds. Okay, moving on. Our setting is an Earth-like planet called Origin, where lots of organisms are suspiciously similar to the ones on Earth. In this video, I'll talk about seven marine reptiles on Origin, four of which are birds because birds are awesome and y'all don't give me criticism, and then three other reptiles that are more along the lines of what people think of when they hear reptile. One of them is another archosaur though, because I'm biased. Before we even get into that, I'll share some honorable mentions from videos long past. The lesser bubblegum bird from my second Specivo video is a semi-aquatic herbivore that's not very intelligent, but it is super aggressive. Another marine reptile is likely extinct on today's origin, but its descendants are plentiful, though not aquatic. It could shoot super powerful lasers from its mouth, just like Nusha's today. That one's from my Sapient Dragons video. The Fisher Drake is another semi-aquatic bird, this time from my Quadrupedal Birds video. It spends most of its time out of water, but it does go into rivers and lakes to feed on the fish inside. That's it for the honorable mentions, so let's explore the waters of origin and learn about some marine reptiles. In the seas by the Great Islands, a small reptile can occasionally be seen fending off foes twice its size. It's 10 centimeters long on average and not very massive, but it has a strong venom on its tail that can pierce the skin of most animals. The venom actually comes from its mouth, but it does a bit of an Ouroboros to drench its tail which has a notch to hold venom even underwater. Here's the scorpion gecko. This little guy is an omnivore that will eat pretty much anything that can fit in its mouth. It eats small fish and invertebrates, plankton, and often takes bites out of plants. It's not actually a gecko and seems to be the last living species of a once diverse lineage of huge marine reptiles we call mosasaurs. Its body is warm blooded just like its mosasaur ancestors. They live their whole lives underwater, but keep close to the warm surface where the sun hits. They can regulate their body temperature, but being so small they can't do it as well as larger animals. As climate change is drastically warming origin and its waters, the population of scorpion geckos is skyrocketing. This has ruined the popularity of most beaches on the islands, and that's the least of origin's problems when it comes to climate change. Anyway, though scorpion geckos are considered pests by Moch, a few reptile lovers like to keep them as pets. They don't live longer than 5 years, but they're surprisingly easy to take care of if you can keep the water clean and free of their own venom. In the northern seas close to the ice, a brightly colored animal swims around to catch fish. It breeds on land and walks awkwardly there. But it's a surprisingly adept swimmer that is also a very caring parent that takes care of its children for more than a third of their lifespan. Unfortunately, its numbers are low as both adults and their eggs are rich in fat and a delicacy around the world. The heads of males are adorned with iridescent purple and green, while the females are a drab shade of brown all over. This is the king mallard. Like I said, hunting has a strong effect on their population. The ratio of females to males is 7 to 1, and the latter have actually started to evolve in favor of more drab coloring. Chicks often grow up without two parents, leading them to be more likely to die of hunger or predation, as one parent can always take care of more than one chick. On the bright side, orphan chicks sometimes get adopted by older couples that can't reproduce themselves, and hunting them is now illegal in Noir and Draconia, which is where most of them live. This was a very recent change, so we haven't seen the benefits yet. The outlook is hopeful, but climate change brings a whole new challenge as the ice is melting at frightening rates. Efforts have already started in learning their genome and doing what science can do to preserve their memory if things go south. We're not expecting to hear so much about climate change in a silly speculative evolution video, were ya? Well, it affects water a whole lot more than anything else, so it feels wrong not to spend some time on the topic. I'll lay off it now though. Although the King Mallard doesn't have any compelling defense mechanisms in combat, it usually escapes predators by waddling or rolling into the water and swimming speedily away. Unfortunately, they're still easy prey for the last marine reptile in this video. 
a rare find in tropical waters around the equator, is a certain marine crocodilomorph. It's a carnivore with powerful jaws that isn't as dangerous as you'd think. Maybe it just doesn't like the taste of people, but it usually stays away. Younger ones will approach people with curiosity, but again, don't usually attack. Over the course of history, there have been three documented unprovoked attacks on these people by animals, all of which were by emaciated crocs and small victims. They usually eat small to medium sized fish, the good old chase and attack way. They can grow up to 3 meters long and can weigh more than 250 kilograms. This is the hammerhead crocodile. These rare apex predators are rare for a reason. They give live birth to one pup at a time every 5 to 10 years. The pups unfortunately don't have a very high survival rate to adulthood, making this a naturally rare species. On top of that, the bulls are hunted for their unique heads, putting them into a critically endangered status. They have big tough scales all over the dorsal side of their body, and their unser side is a bit softer. As an archosaur, it's classified with the dragon element. While most of the animals in this video have the same classification, the hammerhead crocodile has some particularly powerful magic. Yeah, I'm going to talk about magic. No one knows exactly why it evolved the weirdly shaped head, but the main hypothesis is that it has to do with the way it uses magic. Dragons are known for their raw magic that even animals can use to a terrifying extent. Although these crocs don't hunt with this magic because they blast their prey to dust, they use it when they feel threatened. Humans usually end up being the ones on the other end of this high energy beam when they try to harvest it for its head and other parts. It's illegal to hunt them in most other regions, which is why other species of people don't usually get attacked in this way. The aftermath of the beam is actually quite beneficial for its surroundings, as it leaves a lot of extra heat in the area for other animals to enjoy. If you see a bright light erupting from the water at night, this is most likely from the hammerhead. They have to release one every month or so to make sure nothing is pent up. These are shot straight into the air from the surface of the water, so they're quite pretty to see from the beach at night. They can go up to 40 meters in the air before they fall back down and disperse into the water. In 1990, one was too close to the land and the wind brought it to fall into a road by the beach. The crater is a tourist attraction now, which has a 3 meter radius and goes 2 meters into the ground at the tip. Another marine archosaur with powerful magic is a bit more amphibious. They're huge animals, the males of which can grow up to 6 meters and weigh upwards of 4,000 kilograms, while the females are about two-thirds the length and half the weight. They are one of the heaviest bird species on origin, only beat by the last marine reptile in this video. Their bones have evolved to be dense, which are covered in sturdy muscle which is covered in thick fat. They live in the cold south around the ice caps. They stay dry for a few weeks out of the year for mating season, but usually keep to the water once they're adults. This is the elephant pennant. These tanks of an animal gather by the thousands on land for breeding season. The males battle it out with sheer force and heavy magic attacks to mate with a group of females. The trunk-like nose allows them to inhale huge amounts of oxygen to transform into raw energy. The laser attacks are usually hollow enough that they do damage without killing their fellow bird, but a well-fed hammock can burn a hole through a mountain if they're pent up enough. Even though an attack might not usually be able to kill another of their own, it is extremely dangerous for anyone to enter their territory while they're on land. Not only could you get blown away by a stray attack, it's just not a good idea to be around 4 ton animals when they're frustrated and angry. No one really tries to hunt them, though the occasional attention hungry social media user will visit the common gathering places of the elephant hennet and never come back. The elephant hennet eats fish and pretty much anything else that swims underwater, preferring large prey that still fit in its mouth. On land, they've been seen catching birds out of the sky with their large mouth and chewing them up before swallowing. How does it chew? Well, they have tooth-like projections around the inside of their mouth that likely evolved from the gizzard. The muscles blend up an animal while it's still in the mouth and it goes all the way down its throat. Climate change has been affecting their population, but not to a huge extent. We're not seeing as many record-breaking sizes as we used to, so it seems like they may not be growing as large because of the heat. Hopefully our descendants will still be able to marvel at these huge animals for many millennia to come. This giant reptile is only found around the Great Islands and it has a unique relationship to a species of plant near it. 
This animal has a stomach unlike any other, and it seems to eat large quantities of dirt. The rest of its diet is mostly plant matter and the occasional carcass, but it doesn't eat as many calories as you'd think for such a large animal. That's because of its mutualistic relationship with an aquatic species of aloe. By some metabolic process, the dirt it eats grows on its back and the aloe plant grows into it. A fully grown adult has two rows of huge leaves going all along its back and tail like the plates of a stegosaurus. This is the Globglosaurus. The Globglosaurus family tree is not well understood. It was traditionally placed with archosaurs, but is nowadays thought to be closer to tuataras, iguanas, or even some ancient lineage of proto-reptiles. That was an order of most widely accepted to less widely accepted. The aloe on its back is a dark green color and does more photosynthesis than a plant usually would. This is because some of that energy goes to the globulosaurus, while that gives you nutrients like nitrogen to the aloe plant. The plant also provides protection from the sun and is used in display for mates. The brighter the colors, the healthier the globulosaurus. The young ones, known as globlets, have darker colors while the older ones fade. They can live up to 100 years, but usually pass around 70. For most of history, they were impervious to any hunting methods attempted by people of the time, thanks to the high magic defense of the Globlosaurus. Once heavier physical weapons were made, hunting of the beast became possible, and then quickly banned thanks to their status as some kind of holy ambassador between plant and animal. The Blue Nusias had interesting religious practices. Anyway, there's one pelt of well-preserved Globlosaurus that lasted the thousands of years since that short time of their hunting being legal that is very popular showcase in the Animapolis Museum of Ancient History. Though the Globlosaurus is rare and only appears around one area, it's extremely popular in zoos around origin and is one of the most well-known animals in the world. Technically, one of the most well-known plants as well, though the animal side gets most of the attention. In the quiet mist above the depths of the open ocean, a lonely animal paddles over the restless waves. I was definitely trying too hard with that sentence. Okay, in the dark of night, when the clouds are low and heavy fog makes it difficult to see more than a few meters ahead, sailors claim to see the silhouette of a great dragon through the haze. They hear faint whispers, and there are old reports of medieval sailors diving off ships to investigate or are never seen again. It's really quite a peaceful animal, but it stares eerily at commercial ships and yachts passing by. It doesn't make a sound, but those who are close swear that they hear faint whispers in an unknown tongue. This is the Mute Leviathan. In 2040, a well-known billionaire's yacht encountered this animal, making the first sighting for a few years. The billionaire was captivated by its whispers, but the boat captain sped the boat away from the leviathan against the orders of the billionaire, who suffered from audio hallucinations for days after and died that week of some mysterious illness. This billionaire was known for his fascination with the ocean, but also for the copious amounts of waste he and his company's executives were responsible for pouring into the ocean. No one knows how a big bird could have known what kind of man he was or what he did, and nothing like his death had ever happened before or after, or at least it hadn't been documented. So the whole debacle remains a mystery to this day. The Leviathan eats small animals and plants near the surface of the water, though many claims have been made about it eating people that it lures from boats. While these claims are difficult to prove, they are also difficult to disprove. The Leviathan can't fly and is too light to submerge its whole body underwater. That would mean that to feed, it can only find food above and below 4 meters from the water's surface, or the length of its neck. It hasn't been seen eating very much, but it isn't sighted very much at all. Though its physics don't technically allow it to submerge like I said, it's possible that it does so by other means. This would explain why it's so uncommon for a human to see it outside a dark, foggy night. In addition to the dragon element, it's been classified under psychic rather than water. It's suspected to have some supernatural abilities, as that would be the only explanation for all the mysteries it's associated with. Maybe someday I'll talk more about the psychic elementals and their abilities. 
The last animal I'll talk about today is an apex predator that works in groups. It's one of the more intelligent animals on origin, though not quite enough to receive rights of personhood. They are social and can communicate with complex clicking sounds. There are populations all over Origin's Great Seas, with each with adaptations to their own environment, such as more blubber in colder areas and smaller mass in areas with less available food. They're all closely related enough to be their own species, and are thought of more as different races. The one I'm drawing is found near Northern Draconia, and it has the largest individuals. Males can grow longer than 10 meters and weigh well over 6,000 kilograms or 6 metric tons. The patterns on their faces and beaks grow brighter when the animal is in mating condition and dim when they grow older than 40. They typically live around 80 years, but one particularly huge male was nicknamed Jack Neutral was reported to be older than 150 when he passed in 1987. This is the killer auk. The killer auk is the ultimate apex predator, eating anything that lives in the sea. It prefers to prey on other dragons, though it isn't picky when it's hungry. It can easily eat small prey like the king mallard, but usually work in groups to conquer beasts like the hammerhead or the hennet. They won't eat most people, but are extremely dangerous to nuishas. No one really knows why dragons are so aggressive to other dragons, but it's something that can be observed consistently across Origin. The killer auk is one of the more well-studied dragons on Origin, as it's hugely important to seafaring culture in multiple regions. To the Noir, it's the dragon that brings back those who would have drowned, and to the Nucius, it's the dragon that drowns and eats shipfuls of people. They call it El Rey Ahogador. On a softer note, they're known to be caring parents, giving live birth and raising their calf for at least 10 years. Both parents take part in raising the calf for the first year, and then the male leaves to mate again while the female stays to continue taking care of the calf. This doesn't always happen and some older couples will stay together for the rest of their lives. Many times adult pairs will stay together without having calves at all, and they seem to be quite happy. A movement's going on to give killer ox and a few other animals rights to personhood, but it's losing steam as other problems keep cropping up. There have been attempts to keep them in captivity, but they never go very well. Though the killer ox aren't usually seen using magic outright, like the laser beams of others, those in captivity will go on a rampage, turning brick to rubble, until they get back to the open ocean. It's now illegal to capture them, so most people will never see a killer ox in person. That's about it for this video, I hope you enjoyed. Check out my Patreon, which you can subscribe to for just a dollar a month, and you'll get your name at the end of my videos. Thanks Captain Kobop! My next video will be a bit of a sequel to Wolves in Sheep's Clothing, about sapient mimicry. Hope to see you there, consider subscribing, and thanks for watching!